All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hugh Sung. I am the assistant of the oral history program with the Battleship New Jersey, which is docked here in Camden, New Jersey. And today is Monday, December 31st of 2018. Happy New Year. And we are on board the Battleship New Jersey. And our interview guest is uh, Glenn Van Leer uh, from Virginia. And Mr. Van Leer was a veteran of the United States Navy who served on board the USS Coral Sea, CB-43, as well as the Battleship New Jersey, BB-62, which we are on board today. Uh, Mr. Van Leer served the Navy from 1948 to 1952. So without further ado, uh, welcome back to the Battleship, Mr. Van Leer. Thank you. Yes, doing well? Thank you. Okay, is this your first time back on this ship, sir? Yes, it is. My first trip back. Okay. How does it feel to be back? Oh, how does it feel to be back, sir? Well, it makes it... It brings back a lot of memories because I've been on a lot of on a lot of the square feet of this of this great ship because I was in the radio gang at that time and so I've been everywhere from a captain's quarters to the mess hall. Okay, yes, sir. All right, before we begin, uh, I'm going to ask you to remove your cover, please. I'm going to ask you to remove your cover, please. Uh, your cover, sir. Oh. Yes, thank you, sir. All right, so uh, let's begin this conversation uh, about yourself. So I understand you served in the Navy starting from 1948, but you did grow up uh, during World War II. Yes. Uh, so why don't you talk about uh, growing up uh, from the build-up to Pearl Harbor and then all the way to victory. Uh, anything you remember or want to talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about uh, I remember. I remember that I was only 11 years old when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. At that time, we were living in the city that I was born in, and we were in, the, in my home with my mother and my sister were there during that time. And we were, and it, we, we were listening to the radio, because of course at that time there was no TV. And we were listening to the radio sitting, sitting by the uh, old coal stove that we had to use for heat, and uh, we were we were a little shocked when we heard the announcement that uh, that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and that was in uh, December the seventh, nineteen forty-one, and from there, I, of course, I was still uh, in school at that time, and shortly after that, in nineteen forty-two. Uh, my parents bought a bought a farm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and I changed schools and went to high school. In it was called North River High School, and I I remember that at that time, and I was the only boy in the school when we started. That my mother did bought for me a pair of knickers that I wore to school and of course the boys laughed at me but I wore them until that, that particular Christmas in 1942 and my brother bought me a pair of long pants and that was the first time I had long pants and then, then we moved to the farm in which uh, I, I in turn uh, started there when I was uh, started at that time we only had four grades of high school we didn't have an intermediate school or middle school and I started to school there in the fall of 1942 and played uh, sports there played basketball and baseball did not was not able to play any football because during the war the the school system couldn't afford the equipment and things, so we didn't get to play in football. But we did play baseball and basketball. Uh, from from there, uh, I went to uh, went to work when I was uh, 16 years old, right shortly after I graduated from uh, from high school in June of 1946, and after, shortly after that, I went to work. My, my first job, my brother 
helped me get this job. I was only 16 years old, but I went to work in a, in a creamery in Stanton, Virginia, called Augusta Dairies. And from there, I went to two or three other jobs. And then that's when I made up my mind I, I, I was going to join the Navy. Right. Yes, sir. Because of the of the opportunities that, that was presented to me. Okay. My mother didn't want me to do that, but at the same time, I felt like that I needed to, which I did. From there, we went on this uh, mid midshipman, not midshipman, but a a uh, reserve cruise on the Coral Sea for two weeks. Okay. That was in, in the early fall of 1947. All right, sir. Uh, don't mean to cut you off, just to backtrack a little bit. Okay. Uh, uh, you said you um, went to school in Shenandoah, right? I'm sorry. Uh, you went to school in the Shenandoah Valley, correct, yes, sir? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, what was your original hometown before that? I lived in Clifton Forge, Virginia. That's uh, where I was born. Oh, okay. Now, uh, let's talk about, uh, you, you talked about where you were when Pearl Harbor hit. Uh, how about, do you remember the VJ Day when Victory finally yes, came? Yes, I remember VJ Day. Day. Uh, I heard it on the, again on the radio. I was on a farm and uh, I was in the yard, outside in the, in the yard next to the, to the front porch. And I heard this, and uh, I said, oh, my, I just, and I, I remember saying this, oh, my, I just missed it. Okay. Because I, was, I wasn't old enough at that time. Okay. Uh, anything, I was in 44. All right. Anything you remember from the home front during the war? Like any um, thing on the radio or in the news, like buy war bonds or anything like that? No. Okay. No. Yeah, because I knew that's a big thing back I, then, but... I, I do remember uh, some people that were in the Navy or the Navy Reserve at that time, and one of the fellows' name name was and uh, he was a he was a yeoman, and his name was Eddie Hockman, and he's the one who kind of talked me into <laughs> joining him in the, in the Navy Reserve Station, and then the uh, the quartermaster there. His name was, oh gosh, jogging my memory now, uh, Al, I can't think of his last name. Right, that's all right, sir. Holsinger. Okay, sir. Holsinger, what's his name? I'm not sure if that's all right. But anyway, uh, I went and signed up, and and, uh, and then there was some other fellas and I that after, after, in particular, after we all got onto active duty, we were stationed in Norfolk, and, and in the times that we were just stationed there, of course, we weren't out to sea, but uh, we used to ride together backwards and forwards on the weekend to, to the Shenandoah Valley. Right. Uh, do you remember how old you were when you enlisted? Yes, sir. I, I was uh, 18. All right, yes, sir. And where'd you go to boot camp? Uh, I did. I went to boot camp right there at that Naval Reserve Training Center. That's okay. where I went to boot camp. Okay. Where was that again, sir? I was at Fishersville, Virginia. Okay. Anything you remember from boot camp? Hmm? Oh, anything you remember from boot camp? No, not really. Oh, okay. Not a whole lot. <laughs> All right. Oh, then I, I peeled a lot of potatoes. <laughs> All right, sir. That was while I was in Norfolk. After, after they called me to active duty on on October. October the fourth of yeah October the fourth in nineteen gosh you tested my memory forty eight yeah okay. and I, they they sent me to Richmond Virginia to the Naval Reserve Station there and I was there only a couple of days and then they assigned me to the radio school in Norfolk to become a uh, more accomplished radio operator okay and and I was at I was at that school for two weeks before they uh, shipped me to Bayonne, New Jersey, which I had never heard of before. Didn't have no idea where Bayonne, New Jersey was. But, I, but they, they had orders to ride a train from Norfolk to Bayonne, where I went aboard to New Jersey. That, okay. was, that was in October 
1950. Okay. Now, before we get to New Jersey, uh, you were first assigned to the Coral Sea, right, sir? Yes, I was on, okay. on well, yes. All right. That was during my reserve time. Okay. That was part of my reserve training, was going, going aboard the, the Coral Sea and making the cruise to uh, the Caribbean, really. All right. Anything you remember from the Coral Sea? Uh, yeah, when we, when we came back, on our way back to Norfolk after two, ten days to two weeks in the Caribbean, uh, we ran into a hurricane off the coast of Florida. And I, I remember looking out the porthole and I seen waves over top of the flight deck. And that was quite an experience for me. <laughs> of course, everything, all the hat, everything was hat down and okay. uh, you couldn't get out. And then, of course, I didn't want to be out either. But, uh, but we got through it all right. But, that was aboard the Coral Sea. All right. And all the airplanes and ordinances had well, to be uh, during that, tied During down, that right? same period of time, uh, there was a lot of uh, sailors. Uh, uh, you could see them sitting on the deck in the, uh, in the first deck, and a lot of them got seasick. I, I was able to survive the seasickness, but uh, I, knew, <laughs> I knew it would have been, been no fun. Oh, yes, sir. Now, the, all the planes and ordinances had to be tied down, right? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Do you remember them on the flight deck or in the hangar? Yes, I seen I seen them take off on the flight deck. I seen them land. I, I was again I was signed to the radio group, and uh, we were we were up uh, in the conning tower somewhere. I forget exactly where we were. But... Okay. Uh, why don't you describe uh, your job as the uh, radio man? Well, when I when I first went aboard, the Coral Sea, I'd had a little bit of, well, I'd had a couple of weeks of, of radio training, learning Morse code and learning to type as fast as I could and, and the importance of accuracy in, in the way we copied code. And we, 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 when we left Norfolk and went aboard the New Jersey, I was only copying code at about 20, 25 words a minute at the most. And that, that wasn't real solid, but at the same time, uh, I was doing enough to. Uh, and then after, after I got aboard the uh, Jersey in Bayonne, they lost my sea bag, <laughs> and I had to. I went aboard the Jersey uh, without a sea bag for about about ten days uh -huh. before they finally called me from a train station and and told me to come there and pick up my sleep bag and don't, don't think that I didn't have some dirty clothes by then. So I, I went ashore and, and uh, picked up my sleep bag and, and I came back to the Jersey at that time. Uh, when I went aboard the Jersey, yeah, uh, from, the, from the fan tail, uh, you could see the skyline of New York City. And I, of course, I, being an old country boy, I had never seen anything like that in my life. And I couldn't hardly wait until until I got liberty to go over and, and explore and see the uh, adventures of, of New York City. Okay. So there that, was one fellow that, that I associated with. Uh, I haven't heard, I used to exchange Christmas cards with him and his name was Ralph Bosco. And he, lived, he came out of Harrison, New York. And uh, I used to hang out with them. And of course he was familiar with enough of, of New York City and he'd take me to some of the places there. Okay. We, we were in the dry dock in Brooklyn Navy Yard before, before we made the first shakedown cruise to, again, to, to Gitmo. And that was in December, December, January. That was in January of... I think 51, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, while, while you were in Bayonne, uh, when you saw the battleship for the first time, okay. did you have any first impressions about the ship? One, one, of the, one of the first assignments that I had was to scrape all the cosmoline off of the radio antennas. Oh, and yes. that, uh, <laughs> that kind of exposed you to heights and, uh, and the conditions of, and the reason why the cosmoline was, was put on. Oh, well, yes. Uh, An anti corrosive material. Right. All right. Uh, were you on board during the recommissioning ceremony? Yes, and I, yes, and that was, uh, 
that was while we were, were getting, we had just been, got out of dry dock in, in, the, in the Elizabeth Ritter River outside of New York City. Okay. And we, well, again, we went on a shakedown cruise from there to, uh, to Guantanamo. And no, that was the only place we went that trip. Okay. Except back to Norfolk. All right. And then, the, and then we got a sign from there to go to uh, Korea. And that was in early of 51. February 51, we went through the Panama Canal. Okay. From there to Pearl Harbor, Honolulu. And from, we was there about a week and went from there to uh, to Japan, Yokosuka, Japan, where we had to, again, had to anchor offshore. And uh, we spent maybe two weeks there. Quite an experience for an old country boy that hadn't hardly been out of the country, or hadn't been out of the county hardly. And uh, to go there and they talk about exchange and money, at that time it was, 1,460 yen per dollar, and uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to comprehend that. <laughs> yes, uh, do you remember the ship going through the canal? Yes. Like, remember that yes, tight I squeeze? Do. I remember that particular, well, the ship anchored just before you start through the locks, and we spent the night before you go into the locks, and uh, a lot of the sailors were given permission to go swimming. They'd dive off of the off the main deck and into the into water there and I didn't do it but uh, a lot of the guys that, that, that I knew did and the next morning we made preparations to go through the locks. It took us several hours to go through the locks and uh, then when we got on the other side uh, on the Pacific side uh, again we, we anchored there and, and the uh, boatsmen they swung over the side and done a lot of scraping and painting and I didn't help do that but I did help them scrub the deck some. Okay, and, that was called holy stoning, right? And then we were there in uh, just off from uh, Panama City uh, maybe maybe three or four days, I forget exactly. And then we went straight from there to Pearl Harbor, from Pearl Harbor to uh, and, and uh, Honolulu. And we were there in Hawaii uh, about seven days before we left there and went to Yokosuka, Japan, in which we were there for, I don't know, probably two weeks. And then we left Yokosuka and went to the, went to Korea and went into I remember going into Korea, there's a, there's a channel that we had to go through. There's two big monstrous uh, rocks and we had to sail through those rocks, through, yeah, through those boulders as you, enter, as you enter into Seoul, Korea. And of course we had to anchor out there too because we couldn't get uh, to shore. The only way we could get to shore was uh, by uh, uh, by small boats, smaller boats, and had boatsmen take us to the, to the piers and things. And we got to go ashore a couple times. And then we left there and they told us that we were, we were going to go on a, uh, a bombardment uh, expedition. And of course, a lot of us, we didn't know what they were talking about. But anyway, they, they almost made a uh, mistake. This was on a Saturday. And they almost made a mistake to have us muster on the main deck. But they called it off at the last minute, and it's a good thing it did, because that was the only time that we took ever took any artillery hits was for that time. That one time and it, if I remember right, it just killed killed one sailor, but other than that, uh, uh, yeah, and that then, then we stayed there and bumped with the sixteen inch Guns. We bombarded the coast of Korea inland uh, for a few days of that, and then we went back out to sea, got everything back in. We went back in there again, 
And, but we didn't get hit that time. And then we left there and went back to Japan. Was that the completion of the first tour, sir? I'm sorry. Was that the completion of the first tour, sir? Yeah, that was. Okay. That was yeah, the, the first first trip there. Okay. Second, second trip there, uh, we did not again did not get any hits from shore from shore bombardment, but uh, we had some close calls, but no 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 hits on the ship. Okay, yeah, just to backtrack uh, to that hit. Um, do you remember uh, the, where you were when that when the shell hit? Yeah, the ship? I had al I had already mustered up on the second deck, and there was several of us around there. And when they when they called it off and sent us all back uh, below deck, that's that's when that I do remember the boy that that got killed uh, because he was on his way. They took him on his way back after he got shot or. Uh, I guess he got hit by shrapnel, and they took him down to sick bay, and I remember seeing him come through our living quarter, or our quarters where our, where our bunks were that we that we slept in. I remember seeing him laying there uh, yeah, on this uh, stretcher that they was carrying him on. Yeah, that that was Seaman Osterwind. That was Seaman uh, Robert Osterwind. That was his name, sir. I, I don't remember what his name was. But. Okay. Uh, do you remember the? Uh, effects of the hit? On yeah, the ship. it hit on the uh, hit on the port side, right below one of the five-inch turrets. Just in, and 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 that before that, before it hit, there was actually a uh, muster station for one of the divisions. I don't. It wasn't our division. It was, it was another division. I don't remember which one it was, but it did hit on the port side. All right. And uh, can you describe the ship return firing? Uh, I'm sure they did, but I, I don't remember that too much. Oh, okay. Oh, was that the first time the ship uh, opened fire, or did you fire before? Uh, no, we had, we had been to Gunnery, if I remember right, there was, there was a place down in the, an area down in the Coral Sea where they take them and they, and they fire the uh, five-inch guns, the, 16-inch guns at drones in in the uh, Caribbean Sea somewhere. I don't know exactly where it is. And we've done that for on that first uh, first trip to uh, on that shakedown cruise. Okay. We went down there for that. Yeah. So how was it like feeling the effects of the guns fire? Yeah, it was unusual to see the percussions from the guns had had moved moved this big monster the way it did. Oh, yes. Uh, I do remember this. My, when I was stationed at Border, my battle station was uh, above the main deck, and I, I, it was, there were was radio transmitters up there, and I was assigned to be in that area uh, during the firing of things. And I remember uh, when they would fire the 16-inch the guns, that you could actually, if you'd watch close, you could actually see the projector come over the end of the barrel, and it was red hot. And uh, of course, of course, the distance of accuracy I think was about twenty or twenty-five miles, something like that. Yeah. With the, about twenty-three, sir. Yeah. The, the accuracy range. Really, it's amazing. Right. Do you remember uh, hearing the effects of of bombing Korea? Like, do you remember everybody telling you like the effects with the accuracy? Yeah, I remember uh, they made the announcement on the board ship, but I don't remember exactly what they said, but the, they did make the announcement that they did did uh, hit the, the targets that they were were uh, aimed at, so. Okay. Were you watching it from uh, the top decks, or were you, I, like, in, inside the ship the whole time? When I was at my battle station, I was, I was, I forget how many decks it was up. Well, I believe it from, from the radio, I may be wrong on this, but from the radio, uh, shack to my to my uh, station was seven decks, if I remember right. I was up okay. pretty high. All right, so you're. And of course, there was a transmitter up there that had to be uh, manned during operations. Okay, so you're all the way all the way up in the seventh level, right, sir? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you get to like watch the effects of the uh, shells exploding in the distance? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, cause yeah, I could see I could see it all, particularly and particularly when they would fire 
all nine of them at the same time. <laughs> you could feel the feel how the ship moved back. Uh, I I remember him telling us about how many feet, but I don't remember what that was right now. Okay. It was a pretty good distance. It was more than a football field. I can tell you that. Yes, sir. Uh, just for the historical record, you mentioned your uh, battle stations with all the way up to seventh level. Uh, there's more than one radio uh, room, correct, sir? Isn't there more than one radio room on the ship, sir? More than uh, one video? A uh, radio room. A oh, radio room. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, the main radio room, which we were, were just in, plus a transmitter room, was on the same same deck. And then there was other other radio stations throughout the ship. Uh, uh, but the one that I was assigned to was, uh, was about, seven, about seven decks up, if I remember right. Okay. Uh, anything you remember uh, from being in the radio room or any like information you remember transferring that might be of interest? Yeah, I, I do remember some things. Uh, uh, I was one of the few guys that was, because we had the uh, secret room where they done the encryptions. It was right in behind the radio shack there. I didn't, incidentally, I didn't see it today, but anyway, uh, I was one of the few that was, had permission and was qualified to go in there, not to receive anything or not to send anything, but just to pick up things to be delivered to different officers throughout the, throughout the ship. And they were they were all uh, secret coded. Now, I, of course, I couldn't read them anyway. But uh, and then and then we worked. In most cases, we worked twelve-hour shifts uh, in copying code, and we copied code for all all of the ships in, in our particular fleet and because we were the commanding officer of the particular fleet and uh, there was I forget how many ships it was that we copied code and delivered it to them we had transmitted to them but uh, in some cases we had to take it I remember taking it aboard uh, in Norfolk one time and taking messages aboard a submarine I don't even remember the name of it it was the only time I was ever on a submarine is I had to go down in, in into the submarine and deliver a message. Right, yes, sir. Now, uh, when this ship went on its first tour to Korea, it relieved the Missouri. Uh, do you remember passing by the Missouri? No, I didn't. I don't remember seeing the Missouri at all. Now, I do okay. remember when we got relieved from Yokosuka, Japan, that the USS Wisconsin relieved us in 1950, late, late 50. Late 51. Uh, yes, yeah, the Wisconsin relieved this ship yeah. uh, before this went to the right. second tour. Now, before we, uh, before the ship got to the second tour, is there anything you remember in between? Uh, no, other than the fact that we would probably, we, we realized we was going back to the, to the same area that we'd been before. Okay. And uh, we, we had some memories of it, nothing, but nothing, uh, Accidental or fatal happened during that to us. I'm talking about the, the Jersey. There's nothing happened to us during that second tour. All right, but you didn't go back to the states, uh, did you? No, we didn't go back to the states then. No, but in in December we got relieved by the Wisconsin, and we left there and went back to Pearl Harbor, Honolulu, and I remember I was. I looked out the porthole and seen the diamond head, and I said, well, that's something I can remember that I've never seen before. <laughs> and we were there for about a few days, five days maybe, and then we left there and went back, came back to the, to the stateside and went into Long Beach, California. And we was in Long Beach about a week and I got, that's the only time I had ever been to California or ever, or have ever been since then. But at the same time, we, uh, we did get liberty and I, got, I went into Los Angeles with some of the other guys. And we left there shortly after that and went down the, the coastline to the Panama Canal again, went through the canal the reverse way to go back to Norfolk then. Okay, at some point, uh President of South Korea, Sigmund Rhee, came on board. Do you remember that event? Uh, Sigmund Rhee, uh, the first president of South Korea, 
He no, came on board. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Okay. It may, it may have happened, but I just don't remember for sure. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember uh, interacting with Captain McCorkle? Other than the fact that uh, he treated me with, with great respect and was always friendly to me, and that uh, uh, he, I was in his quarters I don't know how many times. I, uh, he would see me coming with my clipboard and messages, and even if he was in the mess hall he would, or, or was on the bridge, he would motion for me to come and deliver those messages to him. He recognized me, I guess. But uh, I had I done a lot of that. No delivering messages to to various officers. Okay, including the captain. Yeah, including the captain. Okay. Did you interact with any admirals? No. Okay, just captain. No. All right. Uh, so why don't you talk about the ship's second tour? Uh, anything you remember from the second tour in Korea? Well, <clears throat> we basically went in through those same two two big boulders that I was telling you about, and then we went back into that harbor, and then went on up into the I believe it's called the Sea of Japan, and but we didn't do it. Didn't do much that trip. It just basically they knew we was offshore, and they they would witness what we had done there the first time. Okay. I don't know though that any of it was any casualties or anything like that. All right. Did they tell you what you were shooting at? No, not really. Okay, just various targets in the ground. Yeah. Okay, because suppose well, the ship was targeting like railroads. I just, I just thought of another trip that we took. Uh, this was later on in the in the summer of fifty. Yeah, the summer of fifty one. When we took a cruise, just with the regular crew, and we went north from the in the Pacific and went up to where we could see the shoreline of Russia from from the uh, from from the main deck you could see the you could see the shoreline of Russia okay I probably have never told her that but but uh, we just went up and made a tour went up above that and come back down okay and uh, it was just a you didn't encounter any Soviet units we didn't we did not have any exercises or anything like that at that tour no oh, okay but it was something people, people say. You well, have you ever seen Russia? I say yeah, from from water. But the, I never was. I never set foot on the ground there. No. All right. Okay. Uh, so, anything else you remember uh, before you left uh, Korea on the second tour? Well, I was telling you earlier. I don't know what you made any notes about the, the. I was the only sailor that I remember that won a, won a tour to go to visit in northern Japan. I don't remember the name of the little village. It, it wasn't very big, there wasn't a whole lot of people there. Okay. But, I, but I, I rode the train to there, rode across the cable cars up in the mountains of Japan. People don't know about the mountains of Japan, but I rode across the mountains on a cable car and was there for a weekend. Uh, I think I went in there on a on a Saturday morning and, and come out on a Monday. And uh, that was, and I got to see a lot of, of Japanese culture at that time. Right. This was during Liberty, sir? I'm sorry? Oh, was this during Liberty, sir? Yeah, it was during Liberty, yes. Okay. Yes, cable cars are pretty common in But Asia. really, I, I, I didn't have to, didn't do anything. Uh, they, I was, everything was paid for. I didn't have to expend any of, of my yen at that time. Okay. <laughs> it was all paid for. All right. Uh, do you remember hearing the uh, ceasefire, like the news of the ceasefire getting to you? No, I don't remember that. I don't. I can't remember it anyway. Okay. No, I don't remember that. All right. So why don't you talk about the journey um, coming back to the states? Okay. We uh, we were told um, even I don't know whether it was before, but at about the same time as we left Pearl Harbor, that uh, we were going to go to Long Beach, California. And some of the guys would were were able to uh, uh, be discharged from there, and uh, I better not tell you this story. But I tell him that was this story, but uh, there is there is an experience there that uh, I'd rather not have on us. But there was another experience of one time when we were 
we were in Long Beach, and a bunch, of, it's, a few of us had been ashore, and we came back, and we had a first-class radio that was that really was hard to get along with, <laughs> and he was, he was, and we got back to our compartment. He was asleep on the top rack, rack, and there was three or four of us went over to where, to where he was asleep, and we pinned him up against the bulkhead <laughs> in his in his rack, and oh, he raised hell about that. <laughs> I guess we'd all been sober. We probably wouldn't have done that. But I remember his last name. I can't remember his first name, but the, he was something else to get along with. His last name was Webb. W B B. I can even I I just thought of something I I can tell you right now what the call letters were for the New Jersey. I don't know whether that's confidential yet today or not, but it was Nan Easy Peter Peter. N E P P. You can check that out and you'll find it that it's accurate. Okay. As a call letter for the for the for the New Jersey. And okay. we were copying code and things like that. All right. Oh, uh, just to backtrack a little, speaking of New Jersey, it is said that when the guns fired, uh, each shell had a particular dye color. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah, most that I remember was, was red. Okay. Uh, I remember seeing when the, when the projectile came out of the barrel, you could see red. That, that's all I can remember. All right. Of course, a lot of smoke and stuff like that. But. All right, because supposedly the colors were different from the sister ships, so they could tell who was firing. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. E even other navies use that. Oh, okay. Yes. So that just... way you can tell who done what. Okay. Yes. So just wondering if you ever saw it. <laughs> All right. So um, when you got back to the states, this was 1952, right, sir? Uh, yes. Okay. And it you... was right after the right after the first of the year in '52. We went back into Norfolk, and then we went over to. Portsmouth to the dry dock in Portsmouth, Virginia. And we were in dry dock there for a couple months. Uh, and they'd done some changing and things like that. And But uh, that was quite a, not a big experience, but it was something I'd never seen before. And, and uh, we, we were able to go on liberty. And she don't know this, but uh, at that time, uh, some of us went out one night, and, and I had my—I was fortunate enough to, uh, because I had, we had been in Norfolk for long enough that I had to go on home. And just before I got called to active duty, I, I bought a brand new car, bought a brand new Ford. And and before we shipped out to Korea, I called my father that night and told him where I was going to park the car and for him to come and get it, which is about 200 miles away. And he said he would. And he caught a bus and drove, rode down here that night. And before we left Norfolk on our, on our trip to Korea, before we left Norfolk, they, they paged me on this ship. At, uh, and my father was on the quarter deck and that I needed to come come up and see him. Well, I had no idea he was going to be up there. I don't even know how he got on the, on the base at Norfolk, but he did. And uh, I seen him just before before we left to go to Korea. And then he drove my car back. He used the car while I was gone for two years. And not two years, for a year. Okay. Right. So why don't you talk about uh, your leaving the battleship and your discharge from the Navy? When I was discharged? Yes, sir. Oh, um, well, this other fellow I was telling you about that I, uh, we buddied around a whole lot together, went different places together, drank a lot of beer together, and and uh, he was going to get discharged at the same time, and he lived in Houston, and he but he didn't really have any way to to get from Norfolk to Washington, where his flight was out of Washington D.C. So uh, I took him, after we got off the naval base, I took him to Washington to, to the 
which is now the Reagan Airport, and he flew over there, and that was the last time I seen him. But the night after, or the day that we were discharged, he and I was riding around in the car, and we seen a, an advertisement that a, that a uh, very prominent entertainer was going to be at this theater that particular night. And, and, and his name was Nat King Cole. And he and I went to see Nat King Cole that night, parked a car on a street in Norfolk, underneath a, a street light, thinking that would be the safest place, and come back and somebody had broke into my car and took a lot of things that we had in the back seat, even got in the trunk and took things out of it. Of course, I reported to the police and they never did find out, find out anything more about it, but. The, <laughs> that was an experience that we both, I'm sure he remembered, because I, I never talked to him after that. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned that in, uh, was it New York City, where you encountered uh, Dwight Eisenhower? Yes. That's when we were in the, that's when the Jersey was in the... In Bayonne, right? Bayonne, so, yeah. It was, it was in the, uh, at the, at the dry docks in, in Bayonne. So you got to go to New York City for and Liberty. I got to go to New York City on Liberty. And that's when, uh, I, I don't really know why I went into Penn Station, or was going into Penn Station. And I had seen the, the crowd of people over at a stairwell. So I just stopped and, and uh, was watching the crowd. And there was a whole bunch of Marines around him. And, and then I recognized who it was. And it was General Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he walked by me as, within probably 12, 10, 12 feet of myself, and he saluted me and said, how you doing, sailor? I said, I'm doing fine. And he and I saluted each other, and he went on. And uh, that's another one of my memories that, that's ever so bearing. But I got a few more, most, but they're not all military, but I have got one more military thing that, that happened right after I got discharged. Oh, yes, sir. This was, uh, I knew that my brother and his wife lived in Newport News, Virginia, which is right, right across the bay to, uh, to New, he lived in Newport News. And, and he had, in order to get from one, he had to ride a ferry from Norfolk over to Newport News. And while we were on a ferry and standing out on the front of the ferry was another, basically an idol of mine. It was Ben Hogan, the professional golfer. I didn't get to speak to him other than I seen him there and he was talking to people. And then, because during this time I had, I had, uh, I had grown a mustache similar to what I have right now. And I, my, I had communicated with my brother to come and pick me up and we'd go to his house. And I walked right by him and he didn't even recognize me because of the mustache. He'd never seen me with a mustache before. But I spent a few hours with them, and he took me back to, to the uh, ferry that night, and I rode the ferry back because the ferry was right there at the, uh, it docked right there at the entrance to the naval base. And when when he took me back home, I, I didn't see him again for quite some time. Okay. But uh, Ben Hogan, I seen him there, <laughs> on that ferry, same ferry I was on. All right. Uh, uh, anything else from your naval experience uh, before I continue? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about after we got back to the States, we undertook okay. a, a midshipman cruise. Okay, certainly, sir. And we went from <clears throat> Norfolk to La Havre, France, and, and uh, tied up right beside the Korean Mary, which was quite an, another, and she, she, did, she had come across and brought some tourists across the Atlantic, and she, she was tied up there at a pier, and when we were tied up, well, we was actually, oh, you know, we were tied up behind her. Anyway, uh, we went into La Havre, France, and I was able enough to get liberty and to, to go to Paris and 
on Saturday afternoon, we boarded a, a train in La Havre and took us to Paris and uh, they let us out in Paris and then we had liberty there until the following Monday. We checked in a hotel there in Paris and, and, uh, and made the Grand Tour of Paris. <laughs> And uh, I got to go to several places there, the Eiffel Tower and uh, the big, big uh, cathedral there. And I was, I was the only, in the radio gang, I was the only Protestant in the group where all the rest of them were Catholic. And they, we knew that we were gonna leave La Havre and we were going from there, we were gonna go down to Lisbon, Portugal. And that was about a week later, and we went to Lisbon, Portugal, and tied up there, got liberty. And these guys, and that, of course, being a Protestant, I didn't know anything about this place called, it's over in, in Portugal called the Lady of Fatima. And we, we hired a cab, and uh, there was five or six of us in that cab, and he took us over to this cathedral called the Lady of Fatima. And I went in there with them and uh, whatever they done, I tried to do myself because I didn't know all their, their Catholic language. And uh, that was a very enjoyable trip because I got to see a lot of the country of Portugal. We seen, we crossed a bridge and he stopped on the bridge and there was ladies down in the river washing clothes on the rocks. Uh, below the bridge where we stopped and, and watched them wash your clothes. Uh, we got back to uh, to Lisbon, to yeah, and then uh, well we went, went to and got got to go to a bullfight there. Uh, not not one that you see running down the street, but one in a where they where they had uh, had yeah. audiences and a bullfighter and everything was in the ring. Yeah, the arena. And uh, we got to see that, and uh, then we left there and went to went back down to Gitmo. And of course, at that time we had I forget how many well, midshipmen on there, quite a few, but I don't know how many it was. But anyway, of course they'd never been to Gitmo, and they'd never been, uh, and we went out on that uh, firing range while we were down there, so they could see the ship firing uh, both five-inch guns and the sixteen-inch guns. And then we went to uh, Port of Prince Haiti and Dominican Republic. I'm trying to think of the name of the city. Anyway, uh, went there. And while I was while we were in Port of Prince Haiti, I got <laughs> the only time I ever got selected to do shore patrol or in. <laughs> I got elected to do shore patrol that particular Sunday and they took us all to different places and dropped us off. And, uh, I was one of the two or three guys that went to this cat house right. <laughs> which, which we had to go into and help keep order in there because there was a lot of heavy drinking going on. And, Okay. And the midshipman was in there, of course, they'd never been to a place like that. I hadn't either, but I, took, I served shore patrol <laughs> that, that Sunday afternoon. Right. Now, now, shore patrol wasn't just a duty for Master at Arms, was it, sir? Shore patrol was part of the Master at Arms, okay. but of uh, that division, but... but uh, uh, so they would elect other sailors to help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But the shore patrol, they, they felt like they needed more shore patrol and what they had available. So that's when they took volunteers, not volunteer, but they took assigned, assigned volunteers from different divisions. Okay, All right. Did you just have a club or were you issued a sidearm as well? No, I, no sidearm, but I did have a club. Okay. So how was that do like compared with a uh, radio men? Well, it, uh, it was quite an experience because again, being an old country boy, I had never experienced anything like that. And, and uh, we went into this place there, I don't know. But I do remember being there, and people said 
that had been there before and said you'd listen real close and you could hear the voodoo drums in the mountains while we were there. You could hear them uh, over on the mountainside. See, oh, wow. see there's, a, there's this mountain that separates Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, and these get voodoo people you could they would on you could never did hear them on the Dominican side but you'd hear them over on the Haiti side and, uh, and we never did see any of them but you could hear them at a distance yeah, interesting sir and then all right you can continue sir after finishing the first trip of the shore patrol uh, we were in this cat house for oh, probably three hours, in and out of it, and was on our way back to the ship, which again was anchored out from the shoreline, and we went back there. And But you never realize how, how those people live. It is quite an experience to see how they live in in little straw huts and shacks and things like that that the the average American never sees and never except pictures they never see anything and don't know how they're lucky we are to be Americans that can live under better conditions than that. All right, referring to the indigenous peoples there, right? The the native peoples there. Yes. Oh yes. Okay. Oh yes. Now, now for the historical record, uh, cat house, uh, that um, military term. Or jargon. Well, oh, cat house. That's a military term, right? Or yeah, jargon. that's a military term. But other, other than that, it was it was just a regular, uh, it was a regular whorehouse. That's what it was. Okay. <laughs> and and there were several several ladies or girls there that would entertain us and get up on they get up on their tables and dance for us and take their clothes off and <laughs> do anything they wanted to do. <laughs> All right, short. So short patrol included that duty, right? I'm sorry. Short patrol including the, included that duty. Yeah, just, that uh, was it. Control any misbehavior that might go out of hand. No, it didn't have any misbehavior, but but we had to. Well, I had a couple guys that got kind of loud, but outside of that, it wasn't wasn't anything misbehavior. Okay. As far as we having to use anything <laughs> or or had to stop anybody from doing anything. But okay. they, were, they they were on liberty and they could pretty well do what they wanted to do, and most of them did. But the, all right. Okay, so we're just about heading to uh, the uh, uh, closing of this interview. Uh, for the historical record, uh, a lot of researchers uh, are interested in the um, shellback ceremony. Uh, do you remember going through that? Say that again. Uh, the crossing the equator, going oh, from Polywog yes. to Shellback. Yeah, that was after we left uh, uh, Honolulu on, on our way to Japan, and. They they announced it over the loudspeaker about uh, entering into the uh, into the equator, and at the same time, uh, the time changes completely there, and we we didn't we did very few of us knew what day it was or or what time it was for for a long time, so that was yeah that was quite an experience, but uh, and most of us uh, were receptive of the fact that that's where we were. Okay. But uh, that was the only time, yeah, that was the only, well, when we come back, we had to, we'd done the same thing, but. Uh, okay. You remember the activities you went through? No, I don't remember too much about it. Okay. I was, I, I, I may have been on duty or something at that time, at that time, because we, we in the radio gang, we would work uh, 10, 12 hour shifts, and uh, when we weren't on the radio or listening to copying code, we were sleeping. All right. So you didn't go through that ceremony yourself, sir? I'm sorry? You didn't uh, go through that ceremony yourself, sir, right? No, 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 no. Okay. So you didn't become a shellback? But, uh, no, I didn't go through it. But I heard, heard about it. But uh, I, no, I didn't go through it myself. Okay. All right. So uh, looking back, uh, is there any impact that the Navy had on your life that you'd like to say? That the Navy had? Uh, yes, sir. Well, aboard the ship here, and I don't know how close we are to the mess hall, but you could tell what day it was by the child that you got. <laughs> and, but I will say this, 
And the, the jersey at that time was blessed with, I don't know how many, but I know there was had to be at least three or four of them. They were excellent bakers. They would bake apple pies for us. They would bake cakes for us. They'd bake anything we wanted. Oh, yeah. And we could get them uh, when we, at the evening meal. And uh, okay. so how the was other it? thing that most people got tired of was the powdered eggs and, and uh, breakfast with powdered eggs and <laughs> things like that. Okay. And, other, and the other experience was when, when we were at sea, you, you'd be at your breakfast table or uh, where, where you ate, and the food, the plates would slide away from it because the way the ship was rolling. And, and these, that was an experience that you don't see very often. Oh, indeed, sir. If you don't experience, you don't see it at all. But uh, Okay. But before I forget, uh, what's your current age, sir? I'm sorry. Oh, your current age? I'm 89. Okay. Well, we'll so, be 89 tomorrow. I'm 88 right now, but tomorrow I'll be 89. Okay. Yeah. Happy birthday, sir. Yeah, it's something I forgot to ask in the beginning of the interview. All right. So, um... We're just about to the conclusion of this interview. Uh, is there anything that uh, I didn't ask that uh, you would like to uh, mention? Uh, when we were in Paris, we went to the Eiffel Tower, which was quite an experience. And we also, at night, one night, I don't know if it was the first night or not, but I think it was the second night. And we went through the Ark of Triumph, and I stood out there in the middle of the street and took pictures of that. And I got those pictures at home, but uh, we stood in the middle of the street and took a picture of the Ark of Triumph. But uh, and we went to, if I'm saying this right, I think we went to Notre Dame University there, or something related to Notre Notre Dame. And we went through the museum, had uh, the portrait of. Uh, Lisa, is that her name? Mona Lisa? Mona Lisa. Seen that while we was in Paris. Okay. Did you also see uh, Napoleon's tomb? Probably. I, I don't know. Okay. I think we did, but I'm not too sure of that. All right. Because that's uh, another attraction there. Right. All right. Okay, so uh, final question is, uh, as you're well aware, this interview will be uh, preserved in institutions such as State Library. Uh, for future researchers, historians, students, and anybody who might be uh, uh, watching this. Is there anything you like to say as a way to leave a message to any potential watchers? Yeah, there's, there's there was one fellow uh, that he and I were were good good friends and his name was Ralph Bosco and I don't know whether he's still around or not but he lived in Harrison, New York. That's where he lived, where he's from. And I, it, I, you remember me telling, telling you about uh, uh, me having a car while we was in Norfolk. Well, there, most of the guys were in the in the radio gang were were from a, this area north of the Mason Dixon line, and they wanted to come to either Philly or to New Jersey or to New York City, and so I would I take it on Saturday I take a take a load up, load up my car and take them, take them to New York City. And I forgot, I think I charged, didn't charge them about $10 a piece. And I made several trips from Norfolk and I would stay in New York uh, until Sunday afternoon and then we'd go back to Norfolk. I'd meet them at a, at a hotel there. And, uh, that was quite, a, quite an ordeal too. But they always come on to borrow money because they knew I had a little bit of money. <laughs> I'd charge them a little bit of interest and lend them some money. They, these were guys that were in, in the same division that I was in. I, I didn't go out of the division. All right, yes, sir. All right, so is there anything else before I close this interview? Right. Only, only one thing, uh, I think I told Rick this, uh, when we went through the Panama Canal, you'd stand on the side, I think it was the starboard side, and pick flowers off the bank, standing on the on the starboard side of the ship. You could reach over and reach the flowers and pull them off, off the bank. 
Oh, wow, interesting. That was that was going through the Panama Canal. Oh, so these are flowers that were like growing through the um, cracks? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so picking flowers as the ship was going through. <laughs> well, we were that close to the bank, see, that we could reach, you could reach over. And that day that we went through there, it was 120 degrees that day in oh, wow. late January, I think it was, early February. Huh. Well, thank you for the story, sir. All right, well, uh, that would con uh, conclude our interview. So uh, first of all, Mr. Uh, Van Leer, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us, as well as your service to our country. And uh, my name is Hugh Sung, assistant with the Oral History Program on the Battleship New Jersey in Camp New Jersey. And today is Monday, December 31st of 2018, and our interview guest uh, was uh, Mr. Glenn Van Leer. Uh, from Virginia and what city, sir, again? From Stanton, Virginia. And Stanton, in the Virginia. Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. Yes, thank you, sir. From Stanton, Virginia. And this recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, as well as the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, the New Jersey State Library Systems, and all recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. And once again, my name is Hyo Sung, signing off. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Leer. <laughs>